Okay. Great. I'm going to officially open our event now. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Those of you online, those of you who are here in person, uh, it is a pleasure to, to have you here on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people here on the UBC Point Grey campus. Um, and I really do sincerely wish that we could all be here in person, but uh, such a, is life and especially, um, you know, as it turns out, uh, Dawn um, unfortunately became down with COVID. Uh, Dr. Chang Lu, who was organizing the event, came down with COVID. So we are still in times where we have to be quite flexible, but we are very grateful to Don, uh, despite everything, for taking the time to be with us and for reaching out in the first place to share his, his thoughts and ideas with us. Of course, Don almost needs no introduction. He's so well known um, for his, uh, his thoughts on blockchain technology, but he is um, so much more than just blockchain technology. Let me just give a brief introduction to, to Don for those of you who may not be familiar with all of the things that he is, is known for. He is one of the world's leading authorities on the impact of technology on business and society. He's authored 18 books, including Wikonomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything, which has been translated into 25 languages. Um, uh, and Don, you're, for some reason, you've just disappeared. Uh, I don't know why your slides have have disappeared. Maybe they went into hibernation mode, or, or you just uh, pause your screen sharing for a moment. But we've lost you. you we've lost your slides. Uh, we see your calendar. <laughs> so maybe you want to stop sharing and reshare, so we're not seeing your calendar. Um, and Don has been advancing groundbreaking concepts for over three decades. His 1992 bestseller Paradigm Shift helped coin this seminal management concept. And the digital economy written in 1995 changed business thinking about the transformational nature of the internet. Two years later, he helped popularize the term net generation and the digital divide in growing up digital. In 2016, Don co-authored the definitive book about blockchain with his son, Alex Tapscott, Blockchain Revolution, one of the first books I read about blockchain technology, how the technology behind Bitcoin is changing the world. And uh, according to the Harvard Business School's Clay Christensen, the book literally on how to survive and thrive in the next wave of technology-driven disruption. In 2017, Don and Alex co-founded the Blockchain Research Institute, whose 70 plus projects are the defin definitive investigation into blockchain strategy, use cases, implementation challenges, and organizational transformation. Don is a member of the Order of Canada and is ranked second most influential management thinker in the world by Thinker 50, Thinkers 50. He is an adjunct professor at INSEAD and former chancellor of Trent University in Ontario. It's really hard to imagine anyone who's been more prolific, profound, and influential in explaining today's technological revolutions and their impact on the world. Mm -hmm. So with that, Don, uh, and I know you're still not feeling 100%, but we really are so grateful to have you here to share your thoughts with us. And um, so welcome, Don, over to you. And just make sure you're unmuted so we can hear you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, people are, are sending their gratitude to you. And I'll just say as Don talks, if you have questions for Don, uh, maybe just hold them to the end, but post them to the chat and uh, I will moderate those questions later. So Don, over to you. Uh, well, thanks so much, Victoria. Yes, um, I was supposed to be there, um, but there is this virus going around. And it seems just about everybody I know has. Um, and the, I, I was coming to Vancouver for other reasons, and I thought, you know, let's do something with UBC. And Victoria has been a, a collaborator. Um, Anna Hermanson, who goes to, um, to uh, UBC was uh, one of my best employees. It's doing her master's degree there and works with uh, Jessica. I have other friends on the campus. Uh, sorry, works with Victoria. I have other friends. Um, Jessica Lee, I see is on the list here. And, um, and I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. Uh, notwithstanding 
you know, the marvels of Zoom, I, it ain't the same, I have to tell you. I was hoping we could all have a drink afterwards. But <clears throat> um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy uh, to be able to do this. And uh, as we say, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So uh, <laughs> what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, put up a deck here, if that's OK. And then we'll have some time for questions and discussion. Uh, just to confirm, um, uh, oh, and, and uh, we also have Andrew uh, Facciolo, uh, who's in British Columbia with the um, Blogs, Blockchain Research Institute, and Douglas Heinzman, who's our chief catalyst. I have no reason why Douglas is torturing himself listening to another presentation <laughs> from me, but uh, <clears throat> but he's a, a a great resource and a, a great leader, and um, uh, they're both somebody that you should meet. Andrew is in Vancouver, so he'd uh, be happy to follow up with any of you. Um, let me. Um, where do we start? Just start with a sort of a little background. Um, COVID. The, um, we're still, it's moving from a pandemic to an endemic um, witness that everybody has it, but it's not a, a, a lethal thing or as lethal as it was before. But the economic costs of this thing are devastating and maybe on a scale that we haven't seen in modern times. Uh, the human costs are unfathomable. Canada did pretty well, our death rate compared to the US was a third, um, not, and uh, you know we had to make some sacrifices for the common good, wearing masks and social distancing, getting vaccinated um, and stuff like that. But this, I think this is one of those rare turning points in history. And this thing has, uh, it's causing profound changes to our economy, to our behavior, our society. Uh, some leaders, uh, and governments that failed the challenge will be re replaced or are being replaced. Uh, many institutions are being scrutinized and hopefully changed for the better. Uh, Long-term care in Canada is certainly one of the many examples. And we're having to think big. And we're all having to make changes. And when the dust settles, as it truly must and seems to be doing, you know, this thing is challenging many of the institutions that we have in society. Our systems for supply chains. How can it be in 2022 that one of the biggest problems facing the world is supply chain uh, failure and inadequacy? Um, it's shown weaknesses in our systems for, uh, for data, for health data, for example. Our health data is all locked up in these silos and we can't anonymize it and share it and um, to have a social response to a big problem. So technology um, is not the solution to anything because technology doesn't solve problems, humans do. But we are entering a second era of the digital age where the technology that we have holds a vast and profound uh, uh, potential to bring about some, to enable us to bring about some really profound change. And I'd like to just give you a little history on this. Um, and I'm dating myself here. Um, I, my first book was in uh, 1982. And uh, it argued that computers would be used by everybody because they were only used by programmers back then. And uh, they would become a communications tool. And that book uh, did not sell very well. Uh, it was a study in bad timing. My mother bought many, many of the copies. Um, and I wrote another book in the 80s that nobody read. Uh, and then I started writing some bestsellers in 93, Paradigm Shift was obviously a big book. And uh, The Digital Economy was the first bestseller about the web. And um, although I was competing with Bill Gates at the time on the bestsellers list, and he'd written a book called The Road Ahead about the information superhighway. Um, but since then, there have been lots of uh, uh, books that have been uh, successful. And 20 years after uh, the digital economy came out, I was asked to write an anniversary edition. So I had to think about what's happened with the web over these 20 years. 
And I came to a, a conclusion that kind of surprised me that we'd been through a first era of the digital age, mainframes, mini computers, PCs, the internet, the cloud, uh, social media, uh, uh, the mobile web, uh, big data. And now we are entering the second era where technology is infusing itself into billions and trillions of inert objects uh, in the world where we have technology that learns to do things that it wasn't programmed to do. And the surprising conclusion that I had was that the foundational technology for the second era would in fact be the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies or blockchain. Um, now blockchain, not the most sonorous word in the world, but I think this is essentially the operating system for the next 50 years. And it's also in some ways the second era of the internet. So let me just explain that idea. Um, for these 40 years, we've had an internet of information. But if I send you some information, a PDF of this deck, which you're welcome to have, I'm actually not sending you the information, I'm sending you a copy. And um, we've got a printing press here. That's what the web essentially has been. And um, that works great for information, but when it comes to things of value, assets, uh, things like money, or securities or intellectual property, the data in our identities or cultural assets like art or music or a vote, vote's an asset, something of value that belongs to somebody. When it comes to those, copying them is not a good idea, okay? You don't want someone copying your identity or your vote. And uh, if I send you a thousand dollars, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, really important that I don't still have the money. <clears throat> so, the way that we manage this problem in our economy is through intermediaries. The problem has uh, been called uh, by cryptographers the double spend problem. Um, and we have banks and credit card companies, and stock exchanges, and, you know, now social media companies, governments that perform all of the business and transaction logic of every type of commerce. They identify the party. They clear and settle transactions, they keep records. And overall, they've, they've done a pretty good job. But increasingly, they're proving to be inadequate. Uh, they're all based on central servers. That, that means that they can be hacked. They exclude 2 billion people from the global economy. They take a piece of value for performing this service, but it's a lot, like 10% to send money from Toronto to Manila. You ever heard of the uh, cross-border email taxes. Um, they slow down the economy. Why does that take a week, or four to seven days for a housekeeper in Toronto to Manila? Um, they capture our data, uh, preventing us from monetizing it and undermining our pri privacy. And overall, they're capturing the, the benefits of the digital economy. So what if we have actually have a bifurcation of wealth now? There's, growing economies, but um, growing social inequality. So what if there were not just an internet of information? What if there were an internet of value, some kind of vast global distributed ledger where anything of value, from money to securities to a vote, uh, could be managed, stored, transacted in a secure and private way? Well, that's in 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto solved the double spend problem. And um, this was an extraordinary thing because for the first time ever, people anywhere could trust each other to do transactions and business peer to peer and without a middleman. And trust is not achieved by um, an intermediary, it's achieved by cryptography, collaboration, and some clever code. This is a native digital medium for value. It's not some interesting new technology. This is a big deal. And I've been at this 40 years. I think this is the biggest one that I have seen. As an aside, we're oblivious to this in Canada. You ask any Canadian government leader, you know, what are the big technologies for Canada? They're gonna say AI and maybe quanta, which is absurd. Quantum is a technology that speeds up processing. That's great. Um, it's not the operating system for the digital age. AI is a, 
cool set of tools. It's already having an impact and will continue to have an impact. So I came up with this really cool analogy, I thought, on why um, blockchains would also be a much more, were a much more secure environment. And then John Oliver, who does late night TV, you know, uh, a funny guy, comedian, had some fun with my analogy, did a whole show on blockchain. So I'm just gonna play that for you now. And you'll see why I don't really use the analogy anymore. And because of the complicated process the network uses to verify records, it is very secure. Now relax, I'm not gonna get into what that process is or how it works, but I will share a really helpful, really dumb metaphor for why it is safe. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hack it, it'd be like turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, someday someone will be able to do that, but for now, it's going to be tough. Hold on, that is an absolutely horrible thought. So why is that reporter so happy about the idea? Because if anyone ever figures out how to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken, that chicken is going to be up. He's going to spend the rest of his life suffering from PTSD and writing haunting poetry about the experience. The things I saw. Buck, buck, buckor. My body is whole, but what of my soul? So you can see why I don't use the analogy anymore. I still think it's pretty good, but anyway. My body is whole, but what of my soul? So, um, just get this slide to advance, that'd be really great. So um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin was the first app of the internet of value. Um, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember what the first app of the internet of information was before the web, it was email. But then you saw the rise of general purpose uh, platforms, the web, and which enabled us to build any app. And that's what we're seeing today. Um, Ethereum, um, I was talking to a Canadian government leader saying, well, Canada just doesn't get this. And I asked him, uh, I'm gonna ask you a question. Don't worry, you won't get the answer because no one ever has. What is the most valuable business ever created in Canada? It's always the most ever. And people say Nortel, Rim, Blackberry, Shopify, RBC is a big bank. Ethereum is a business created in Canada by a 19 year old University of Waterloo dropout that is worth four today, worth four times the value of Shopify. It's worth as much as RBC and the next two banks combined. We're oblivious. Anyway, I digress. Um, smart contracts are enabled by these platforms. Smart, uh, smart contracts, just like what it sounds like, it's sort of a contract that's made out of software. It self polices, self executes. And now there's a really big thing happening where we have all these new platforms. Now there are thousands of them, which is an issue we'll get to. But Polygon enables you to build applications on top of Ethereum. Cosmos and Polkadot, the internet of blockchains, linking blockchains together. Solana, uh, this hot new uh, blockchain. And so this is a time of incredible innovation in these platforms. So second era. Overall, if you want a term to describe the second era, I'm trying to coin this one. Just wrote an article about it, the trivergence. Um, AI, blockchain, the internet of things are coming together. And then the middle here is something called data. And all of this is sitting on cloud. So thank you, um, Victoria, for that much too kind introduction. Uh, so I got together with my son. I wrote the book and the timing on this one was good. And it became the big book. Our publisher says it sold more copies than all other blockchain books combined. And it's now in over 20 languages. So um, this is an internet of value. And it's not just about crypto, although crypto is part of the story. So let me explain that. 
I'm going to talk to you about seven transformations. I'll spend a little bit of uh, more time on the first one, but I could talk to you about 40 of these, but I've only picked seven. Um, if you want to talk about 40, hey, you got a, another six hours, let's go for it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm, there's no way I'm going to survive uh, much more than an hour here. <clears throat> so the first up is financial services. So that's about money, right? Now, people think, well, this is about cryptocurrencies. Well, not really. I mean, currencies are one of nine types of digital assets, but currencies are important. So you got the self-organizing currencies like Bitcoin, you got the corporate currencies that have been having trouble getting off the ground. Facebook had one called DM, but it's basically backed off from that because everybody hates Facebook. Problem wasn't with DM, it was with Facebook. And then there are central bank digital currencies. So inexorably, the Canadian dollar will become a digital currency. Uh, it's not now. And um, if you want to talk about the difference, that's a big one. But this could provide huge benefits to a central bank and to Canada. There are also some worries about it, too. You know, the way it's being implemented in China, their partner, and China's leading doing this, their partner for the implementation of their central bank digital currency is Big Brother. They're going to know every single thing that everyone in the country buys and a lot more. But there's a lot more to financial services than just money. So I don't know if any recognize this um, machine here. It actually has a name. It's called a Rube Goldberg machine. Rube Goldberg was an American engineer and cartoonist. He, he created these ridiculously complicated machines that <laughs> would do something really simple, like open a door or crack an egg. Well, um, I, I look at the financial system and I kind of see that basically, because when all is said and done, it does some really simple things. It enables us to store value. Um, you know, it used to be in safes, now it's in computer systems. They move value around, move money, move stocks, move, you know, whatever. They lend value. You got, uh, you know, various lending um, uh, institutions, commercial loans, and so on. Funding and investing, so there's venture capital, private equity, mutual funds, hedge funds, and so on. They exchange value, so stuff like stock exchanges create markets. They insure value, insurance companies. They analyze value as a whole industry does that. They account for value, big auditing companies come in every year and do an audit. And they authenticate identity. You are who you are, um, uh, you know, that is, or, or authenticate value, that is a dollar, that is a legitimate stock, and so on. Now, every one of these things can be done with software. You don't need an intermediary to do that. Now, um, this is called DeFi. You heard of FinTech? FinTech is like a, just a tip of the iceberg. DeFi is the replacement of those nine things by software. And everyone in Canada likes to talk about FinTech. How silly. FinTech is just a new coat of paint on the building, but it's still the same building. DeFi is a teardown and rebuilding a much more efficient and customer worthy building. Now, furthermore, when it comes to crypto, everyone talks about currencies. Well, they're just one of nine types of tokens. Um, you got protocol tokens. So Ether is the native token of Ethereum. Um, uh, Sol is the native token of Solana. And these are um, the tokens that are foundational to all of these decentralized applications. There are governance tokens and Governance tokens give holders a say in the governance um, of these platforms and of decentralized applications that run on them. And every platform has some kind of governance token. There are um, non-fungible tokens in blockchain revolution six years ago. We had what I thought was a better name, crypto collectibles. 
Who would figure that crypto collectibles would never take hold and that non-fungible tokens would be a more accessible name? Anyway, uh, sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. They're exchange tokens that um, are native to uh, centralized exchanges such as Binance or FTX or stable coins that are a coin or a token pegged to a um, pegged to some kind of um, fiat currency or pegged to some kind of traditional asset like the dollar. Uh, they're natural asset tokens. We can tokenize carbon credits. And we just had a big meeting last week in Toronto and Douglas was running a session where um, um, and Andrew brought people together from 40 countries, or sorry, 40 people from uh, five continents in many countries. And um, this is one of the two big sessions that we did. It's about blockchain and, and sustainability. This is a huge breakthrough in terms of fighting uh, climate change. And then there are central bank digital currencies. So when someone says crypto, don't just think cryptocurrencies. Now, if you want to read more about this, I'll let you take a screenshot or a picture here, Financial Services Revolution. It's a terrific book by Alex. I'm going to show you a few more books. So have your camera or your, your uh, screenshot uh, tool available, available on Amazon. Okay, I'm going to speed it up here so we have some time to talk. Supply chains. Um, think about it. You got... Um, these vast, complicated things. And they are complicated, unnecessarily so. First of all, you got a, a whole bunch of different players. That's necessary. You got a whole bunch of different ways of moving stuff around, planes and boats and trains and trucks and pipelines and so on. But then you've got all these intermediaries, agents and escrow agents and banks. And, and then there are different countries and government authorities and tax authorities and all these different systems. And, EDI and uh, traditional ERP systems. Imagine if all of this were a shared network state, a blockchain. You'd have a single version of the truth. You could have real-time transactions. There, there'd be no three-day settlement period for a payment, you know, clearing and settling of a payment, because the payment and settlement's the same activity. It's just a change to the ledger. Um, you, you can have smart money uh, based on smart contracts. So uh, yeah, you get paid when this happens, the contract figures out, yep, that's been done. So this could really be an extraordinary thing. And um, by the way, at the blockchainresearchinstitute.org, blockchainresearchinstitute.org, we've done, I don't know, seven, $8 million of research, but we've made a lot of it publicly available with the permission and support of our funders. And you can go there and read about uh, projects like this. One of my favorites is fish. Do you know that in um, Vancouver, half of the sushi you eat is not labeled correctly? You got cheap fish labeled as, um, I don't know if it's half. It's, it's much more than that in some places in the world. It's typically like a third in a really sophisticated place. So we'll give you that. But you got endangered species labeled as okay species and so on. And with a blockchain, you can track the provenance of something like this. You know, the problem of conflict diamonds, hundreds of thousands of people have died, funded by diamonds, tribal wars, terrorism, conflict, national conflict, all kinds of stuff. That problem is pretty much eliminated by a multi stakeholder network called the Kimberly Process and a blockchain platform called Everledger. So this is a really big one in our mind. Available on Amazon, supply chain revolution. The best way to purchase is in massive volume. Moving along here. Um, healthcare. Uh, any one of these is a whole speech, <laughs> honestly. But we've got this super fragmented and complex uh, healthcare supply chain. All the partners need transparency. We need to have security, a quick delivery uh, of stuff. We need to prevent human error. You know, the number one killer um, in the healthcare industry 
is the industry. Um, drug interactions, botched treatments, inappropriate diagnoses, and so on. We need supply chain um, uh, integrity, uh, regulatory compliance, and throughout the whole process of, of, of manufacturing and moving stuff around, there are really big opportunities to uh, you know, increase transparency, reduce costs, improve quality, build trust, and so on. Um, but another really big one has to do with the um, the patient record, and uh, you know each of these each of these things I'm showing you these seven things a whole one hour kind of uh, talk. But the University Health Network, the big uh, hospital in Toronto, which is actually rated number three in the world, um, used a blockchain to enable patients to have control over how their health record is used. And, um, and they also have a thing like, for example, in medical research, they have a thing there called um, my UHN that uh, before I leave the hospital after an x-ray and I, I fractured my arm a couple of months ago, don't ask. All right, I was paragliding in the Himalayas and some banditos on horseback were attacking an orphanage and I had to swoop down and save the little children. Uh, <clears throat> No. Um, before I leave the hospital after an x-ray, uh, my radiology report is in my record. Now, the next step is to move that to a blockchain. And it would not only be in your record, but you own it. You can anonymize it, uh, give it to science, sell it, uh, send it to another hospital, get a second opinion, and so on. And this could be part of a big move towards more patient-centered healthcare. Um, I'm guessing most of you believe in science. So you know that we have a, a really big problem here. We need to reduce carbon by 80% in the next 20 years. Um, and even if we do, it'll take a thousand years for the planet to cool down and bad things are already happening. We have a billion and a half people losing most of their um, water supply. So um, we need to fix this. And uh, energy and climate is one of a whole bunch of areas where blockchain can help with sustainability. Now, part of it has to do with this, the way that we create energy. We need to move towards greener and more distributed um, power grids. And uh, to do that, the best way to do that is on a distributed ledger where, you know, ultimately this light bulb here buys some power off of a distributed uh, green grid that finds the best source, the cheapest source, the greenest source, or whatever the light bulb has been um, told to choose. And then when it buys the power, it promptly pays for the power and its reputation as a trustworthy device becomes established. Um, that's not gonna go through Visa those microtransactions, smart contracts. You need blockchains to do all of this. And then on the other end, the whole issue of carbon. So uh, uh, I'm involved in, in something called uh, uh, CarbonX. And we uh, are a company that identify the carbon that's used um, on a crypto platform. For example, we, we, uh, we measured um, the carbon uh, used by a Bitcoin fund and then of all the Bitcoin in the fund. And then we provided carbon credits to make that the first uh, green Bitcoin fund. It's in Toronto. It's called BITC. You can phone up your broker and say, buy me some BITC. It's green uh, Bitcoin. Full disclosure, uh, my co-author and son Alex created the fund. Uh, but but by tokenizing a carbon credit, representing it, that opens up a whole world of amazing things. We can now have much more liquid markets for carbon. We can track better how carbon is used. We can bundle carbon into all kinds of stuff. When I buy a, you know, a carbon neutral coffee mug, um, I would be able to get carbon X tokens or, or actual carbon credits. Um, the representation of those as part of the mug. 
um, showing that the thing has been written off and I can collect these, they're valuable. I can turn them into, you know, whatever, other mugs or real money and so on. So this is a big opportunity. Five is uh, property rights. And um, if any of you saw my TED talk, the one I talked about here was the music and the big problem that musicians have. And um, I'm not gonna go into that today unless you wanna talk about it. But I, I will talk about the issue of land titles. Do you know that 70% of the land titles in the world are, are not enforceable? So you're in Honduras and some dictator comes along, he says, well, you know, you may have a piece of paper that says you own your land, but the government computer says my friend owns your land. That actually happened on a mass scale. You're in India, in Haryana, uh, prior to two years ago, you, you take in your, your, uh, your parents' will and the land title because they just passed away and are giving you the land and some clerk has been bribed and all of a sudden it's not your land and you're paying rent to somebody else for it. So um, this, is a, this is a big problem. So you put land titles on a blockchain and nobody can mess with them um, because they're there. It's transparent. You can't hack it unless you know how to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chick. No, sorry. Um, but this is a really wonderful technology solution. Now there's a big problem getting a valid title in the first place. That's the challenge with all this. But in the Indian um, state of, uh, of Haryana, um, a company called Tech Mahindra has been involved in, in um, working to build um, uh, land titles. And um, you know, I can go into these other ones if you want. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorites. Um, who we got here online? I already picked on Jessica. We'll pick on Victoria. Um, the asset class of the digital age is data. You know who creates it? You do. The virtual Victoria is a mere image of her and probably knows more about her than she does because she can't remember where she was a year ago, what she said a year ago, um, what she uh, ate, what, what, what medication she had, what diagnosis she had, what... Uh, what she got on an exam or, or scored on an exam, all this data that she creates, but it's captured by a new species of business that we call a digital conglomerate. And this is now um, an old diagram, older diagram. And I've got to get a, it's a several years old, but the top six NASDAQ companies own half of NASDAQ. The problem with, with um, you know, Facebook or, or these other companies is not that they're monopolies. The, the problem is that they're becoming the owners of the asset class of the digital age. They're own, starting to own the economy. So um, this is a big, big problem. And for reasons beyond what people think, you know, it means you can't use the data to plan your life. Imagine how useful all that would be for Victoria. It means you can't monetize the data. At Davos, last time I was there, Jared Lanier, a sort of digital thinker type, uh, did some research and he found there's a billion and a half people in the world that could double their income if they had access to their own data. That means that the data is not secure. This is on central servers. Uh, there's and two types of this data those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. And then, uh, well, I guess there's a third one, those that have been hacked and will be hacked again. But um, it means you can't aggregate the data and say a pandemic and our privacy is being undermined. And, you know, people have said to me, well, Don, privacy's dead, get over it. You got nothing to hide. What's your problem? This is ridiculous. This is stupidity. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. And uh, sure, transparency is a big theme. I wrote a whole book about it. I actually wrote the book about it. The first bestseller on transparency. Transparency is for companies and institutions and governments. It's not for people. You have no opportunity to be more transparent. You have an opportunity, except with somebody you're dating maybe, or a very good friend. You, you, au contraire, your responsibility and your opportunity is to protect your personal privacy. So 
we can get this data back on a blockchain. And it's a very big theme called the self-sovereign identity, which I'm very passionate about. We've done a lot of writing about this. And it's going to be a big part of my next book. We need to get this data back so that we, because it represents our identities, so that we can manage our identities responsibly for ourselves and for our families and people that we care about. Self-sovereign identity, huge theme. The final one I'm going to mention is government. There's three pieces to this. Um, we can build better gov governments, the operation of government. Secondly, we can have better governance, strengthening democracy. And I already mentioned central bank digital currencies. So uh, I'm off to Dubai in a month in the Mideast. Uh, the, the government of Dubai wants to be um, the first fully blockchain enabled government where everything pretty much runs on, on blockchains. They're making a lot of progress doing that. Now, when I use an example of this, I'm not saying Dubai is the greatest place in the world, which I'm certainly not, but, um, but government operations can be dramatically performed. I'm happy to talk about that. Then there's the broader issue of governance. Um, we have a crisis of legitimacy of our democratic institutions. Um, a third of the people in the United States think the last government was fake, or the last election was fake, it was a fraud. It was the most scrutinized election in American history, maybe ever. Countless numbers of people counting every vote, and lawsuits, and lawyers, and technology people, and all open, transparent doesn't matter. And, um, and then we had a leader uh, in the United States who actually tried to overturn the results of an election. And a whole bunch of people who think democracy is less important than having our guy in there. Well, that's called moving to an authoritarian type, um, you know, oligarchy or whatever kind of society. I think that would be unfortunate. Uh, what's better than democracy? I don't know, it's sure got imperfections, but what do we want? Religious governments? Jihadist governments? How about libertarianism? Just get rid of government. Um, maybe we should go back to Bolshevism. We need to protect democracy. Now, this is a whole other conversation too that we can have. Um, but th there are many fundamental problems here. One of them is that, uh, the people who vote um, are not the ones with the real power. The politicians are not accountable to them. They're accountable to the people who fund them, which is why they often don't do things in the interests of the majority of the population. Gun control. 94% of Americans think there should be a background check for firearms, but um, Congress won't pass a law saying that because they're not accountable to people. So legitimacy is the idea that you may disagree with who's in power, but at least you think the system is a good one. All around the world, people are questioning. Canada's pretty good. Um, not in terms of, I'm not commenting on our government, I'm talking about the nature of uh, legitimacy. But um, no, uh, this is a really big problem. I mean, uh, Macron, just one in uh, France, but um, Marine Le Pen uh, got, I don't know the exact number, like 30, a high 30s percent of the vote. Or was it 40s? I mean, Hitler got 32% in his last election. So, um, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Now, so what is to be done here and how can technology help? Well, that's a whole other conversation too, but just a little taste of what I think. I think we need a second era of democracy. In the first, we established elected institutions um, and representative institutions, but there was a weak public mandate. Citizens were inert. Uh, politicians were beholden to powerful interests. And we could have a second wave, which is characterized by a culture of public deliberation, active citizenship, transparency. And, and of accountability, where representatives are accountable to citizens. 
So blockchain can help a lot. We wrote about this in Blockchain Revolution. It holds up really well. I'll just give you one example. Why not have a smart vote? You don't just vote for the politician, you vote for their program. And in a smart contract, uh, you can have smart money now, and that will be coming soon. You send your kid to UBC, and you hope that he spends you know, the money you gave him on books and tuition. Um, and uh, and not in the bar, and he goes into the bar and orders a, a mojito, and and the money says, "Sorry, uh, Johnny, I don't do mojitos. I only do books and and tuition." So that's kind of a, a silly example, but money can be uh, programmable and can become smart. So you vote for the program and the politician. If they don't execute the program, then there are consequences. Maybe they are sanction maybe they are uh, they don't get paid maybe they get removed anything is possible so that's a quick tour um let me kind of uh through seven of many many opportunities and um there's your book to cover all of that it's my most recent uh, book volume um uh, it all sounds pretty rosy well it's not there's a million issues and i'm happy to talk about them uh, this is taking a long time it's not because the technology is, is un, unimportant it's because it's so important it changes the deep structure and architecture of the firm changing supply chains the operations of government our regulations all kinds of things the technology is still somewhat immature i remember in 94 i'd show the web to people and it would load on the screen like this this is a single web page people say well that's the stupidest thing i ever saw i'm never gonna use that um blockchain has, has an image problem most of it is not valid there are bad players but this is only used by criminals. Wrong. You know what criminals use? Cash. 3% of all cash. 15 basis points. 15% of 1%. Um, it's used of crypto. It's used for criminal activities. And there are many, many other issues. And then there are the much bigger issues that we need to manage. And I'm not going to go into, but they're both, you know, the, the internet created a bunch of problems. Um, it did lots of wonderful things, but look at, we're doing this zoom call, even though I'm, you know, re recovering, um, from an illness, but, you know, it, it has caused many, many problems in society. I mean, a big one is the fragmentation of public discourse. I thought the internet would bring us together. I said back in 94, well, I think. That's what's going to happen. Could go the other way. We could end up on our own little self-reinforcing echo chambers where the purpose of information, it's not just to inform us, it's to, I don't know, give us comfort or something. So this technology can help us. I think we're going to need nothing less than any social contract. So I'd like to wrap things up um, with a couple of points. All of this has to do with a new paradigm. And I'm allowed to use that word because uh, I wrote the book. <laughs> I didn't invent the term. It came out of a wonderful book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions in the 60s by Thomas Kuhn. But um, Case for a Liberal Arts Undergraduate Education. I read that book and I thought, wow, if that works in science. Maybe it could work everywhere. And when you get a change like this, you get a leadership crisis, vested interests fight against change, and leaders of old paradigms have great difficulty embracing the new. How will you be a leader for this change? Well, you've self-selected by coming to this event. Um, leadership's your opportunity. Happy to describe how. And uh, ta-da, you saw it first. It just went up on Amazon. This is an absolutely wonderful book available for pre-order. Uh, the major essay in it is by Alex, um, and it's just full of just great, great stuff. I'm very, very proud of it. I'm hoping that it will be a very big book. Digital Asset Revolution by Alex Tapscott on the internet. 
So these are the four books just to mention, uh, to review, and uh, I think they're all a great contribution. At the Blockchain Research Institute, our goal is to link the potential of this technology with its actual deployment. And um, we uh, have or are doing uh, 130 research projects. We've got a full suite of online education and services. We have big events. And you can go to blockchainresearchinstitute.org or if you're in Vancouver, um, connect with Andrew and he'll tell you all about it. So to close, um, let me, I'm a little reluctant to do this because our time is valuable, but, uh, valuable, but it's almost um, up for the presentation part. Let me do an analogy about the future. So um, at the BRI, um, we've been studying nature to learn more about these decentralized models of how things work. And bees come in swarms, uh, fish come in schools, starlings over the moors, England, and other places in the world come in something called a murmuration. I, have you heard of that term? It's, it's a word in the dictionary, murmuration. It refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And starlings are out over a you know, 100, no, it's more like a 20 mile radius. Uh, doing their their starling thing foraging for food and so on and at night they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature and the murmuration has a function it protects the birds you can see on the right of the screen here that's a hawk a killer of starlings it's actually 25 times the size of a starling being chased away by the collective power of these little birds and scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. There's leadership, but there's no one leader. And when the moment is right, it's this magic. So is this some kind of fanciful analogy? Or might we actually learn something from it? Well, the murmuration functions according to the implicit principles that I've just shared with you. It's a, remember I said, trust is not achieved by an intermediary. There's no intermediary here. It's achieved by collaboration, like that, and by code. There's code in the, the DNA of the birds that gives it some rules. The big one is don't bump into anybody else. But there are other rules, like don't get too far away. And the murmuration also has this great interdependence. You know, in our session last week, we were talking about a business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And the murmuration has this independent interdependence um, built into it. That's what we need, a declaration of interdependence. It functions as if the interests of an individual bird are related to the interests of the murmuration as a whole. And overall, I would say it has this great integrity. Um, that's the key to the whole thing because integrity is the foundation of trust. Like, what is trust? You ever asked yourself that question? Um, I wrote a book about this and it took me three months to write this sentence, okay? Trust, what is trust? Trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity. Trust is the expectation that the other party will do the right thing. Which is why a little starling will chase after a killer 25 times its size because it knows that the other birds will do the right thing and have its back. And I look at this and I get a lot of hope that, you know, if we connect ourselves on this planet with some kind of new network of glass and, and air and software and cryptography that maybe some of the big intractable problems facing us can be finally solved and that this smaller world that my grandchildren inherit might actually be a better one. So I'm going to end that and uh, I think we have some time for conversation. Well, there, here's my contact information. Um, info at 
Daw at tapscott.com, Twitter at the tapscott. If you want to, or, or just uh, um, reach out to me in the chat to end the fun. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. So um, we'll give you a round of applause here. And a virtual round of applause from those joining online. You've given us a lot of uh, a lot to think about, as as always. And there's lots of uh, questions and, and comments um, coming through on the, the chat. Um, so I will um, just to go through in order, I guess, and, and, uh, and try and pull out some questions. And, and if you spot any that you would like to, to actually um, respond to, um and there's people are sharing information which is wonderful um that we're doing some online networking and uh introducing um our our ourselves online and so um i, I guess i'll start here with uh, this question from andrew tan uh who is um a former uh student um of, of ours here uh, at blockchain at ubc and blockchain at ubc what drives you and your team to learn about Web3? So Web3, you didn't specifically mention, but um, it's certainly part of that, you know, internet of value, digital assets that you, you spoke about. Uh, and what resources does your team use to learn and, and research? So maybe, maybe you could just reflect for us a little bit on, on that question. Sure. Um, well, I I didn't use the word, but I just spoke to you for an hour about Web3. It is synonymous with what I've described. So um, let me explain the, and the internet of value uh, uh, versus the language of Web3, which is good language and it's fine with us and we use it all the time. Um, the first web was a read web. You could go online and you could look at websites. The second web, second era of the web, was web 2.0, as it was called. And it was a read-write web. You could not only look at a website, you could do stuff. You could join an online community. You could participate in Facebook and put up your pictures. You could create a Wikipedia entry, read-write. And the third web, web three, is a read-write own web that's based on blockchain. These, these are two different ways of describing this. And um, you know, I, I prefer the internet of value because I think it's clearer, but to, to describe this as web three is also a great way of talking about it. We don't oppose the term, we don't, um, we use the term, we em embrace the term. So what drives us? I don't know, we could maybe ask Andrew Douglas. <laughs> and so I know what drives me. I wanna live a principled life of consequence. You know? I think that's a so, great uh, answer. Um, I'd love to open it up to our, um, our participants who are joining in person here. Uh, if you do have a question for, for Don, uh, you can turn on your mic at your station and uh, and pose your question. So I see somebody leaning forward. Yeah, go ahead, David. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, very impressive presentation. Actually, then I was uh, in Dubai last month to attending the East Dubai as well. So uh, I met a bunch of the awesome team. And one of them, uh, they are the official team from Australia. And then uh, I heard them saying, uh, Australia is uh, launching their uh, their 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 uh, crypto asset, uh, actually uh, the crypto fiat. And then uh, so I'm not. I want to know your opinion about uh, the uh, Canada. Okay, so uh, <coughs> do you see then in the near future, and Canada will launch our, you know, the uh, uh, crypto fiat in Canada? I'm sorry, the last sentence was, yeah, what do you so see in the, our uh, CDBC in Canada? Yeah. Oh. Um, well, first of all, Canada's doing okay, but not great. Um, 
you know, what I told you about Ethereum, we drove the most biz valuable business ever created in Canada. We drove it out of the country by our regulatory environment. Um, and it's, it's a big issue. Like what, if Silicon Valley was the center of the first era of the digital age, what's going to be the second, the center of the second era? And it won't just be one place, but it could be Canada, still not too late, but right now we're somewhat down on the list, uh, largely because of our regulatory environment. We've got a whole bunch of other wonderful assets. We've got smart, um, educated population, young population. We got pretty good government. We have some good traditional financial institutions. Um, their uh, governments make investments in, in stimulating certain things, but unfortunately they're oblivious to this one, mainly. Um, we could be doing all kinds of changes to tax uh, laws around this that would uh, be helpful. And, and overall, um, we're, we're doing okay. When it comes to central bank digital currencies, there, there's a real leader um, that left the bank. Um, she was the vice governor and she didn't get the job as governor, Tiff Macklin got the job. Um, but um, um, and I, I won't mention her name, but she um, she's a real progressive thinker and innovator on all of this stuff. Uh, and right now, there's a whole big, dis a very rich and intense discussion within the financial institutions and also uh, within the central bank, more broadly in the uh, Department of Finance, about should we adopt a CBDC. And um, there are lots of arguments to do it. The banks are not enthusiastic because that would take away a lot of the things that banks do. Um, in fact, the big economist feature story on central bank digital currencies, the cover was a world without banks. <clears throat> now, we're not going to see that, but you can ex imagine why the CEO of RBC is not exactly jumping on the bandwagon uh, here. And there may be ways that we can have our cake and eat it too. You know, maybe we can get together and have a bunch of uh, 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 financial institutions come together, partnership with government, and create a stable coin pegged to the Canadian dollar. Now, a CBDC would be much more valuable for the central bank because you could have incredible transparency into what's happening. Uh, you know, you put some. Uh, money into the economy, you can see what's happening to it. People are spending it, they're saving it, they're investing, um, they're gambling, and, uh, whatever. And that could be done in a way that protects people's privacy. It'd be a very powerful thing. You want to make a payment to everyone in the population, say during a pandemic, you could helicopter drop it onto, the, onto their mobile devices directly. Um, so there's a real case for this. Um, from a central bank point of view, but will we do it? I don't know. And then, of course, meanwhile, the big elephant in the room is China that's charging ahead with this. And that's why the US, the Federal Reserve is very concerned about this. Because if China, they're, they're rolling out their central bank digital currency across Southeast Asia and Africa. And if they succeed in uh, doing this, they can become the, the currency of record replacing the US dollar. So it's a big source of, uh, of concern and of debate. Again, we've written a bunch of stuff about this. Yeah, very, very interesting thoughts there. Um, I'm gonna jump to a question that's been posed by Jesse McKee here, uh, because it's a question that I get asked a lot, Don, you're probably being yeah. asked it too. How do you respond to the energy use issue to folks who are well outside the blockchain industry and even outside businesses and economic sectors? The issue has given the technology such a barrier to entry, adoption, curiosity for so many who are you know, passionate about uh, making sure that we're addressing climate change. So uh, it, yeah. what advice would you give? Well, um, let's look at the facts. Um, Bitcoin uses a lot of energy. 50% of it is green energy because they locate the mines near cheap sources like um, hydroelectric 
sources. But 50% of a big number is still a big number. That number is declining. And you can buy Bitcoin through green ETFs like the one that I mentioned, the BITC, the nine point uh, Bitcoin fund. But the real, the real answer to this question relates to a second question uh, that was asked here by, um, no, it's just there on my screen, by Chris Constable, which is that Bitcoin uses a consensus mechanism called proof of work. And to make a very, I watch my TED talk and you'll, uh, you know, Mark Twain, I'm sorry I wrote such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short letter. He says this to a friend. It took me two years to be able to describe that in three and a half minutes. So you can see that on the TED talk. But it uses a lot of energy. Bitcoin is now a tiny minority of the consensus mechanisms. And most of them, all the ones that I showed you, for example, Ethereum is moving to that. Um, or use a consensus mechanism, meaning a way of establishing truth and agreement on the network that's called proof of stake. It uses hardly any energy. So this problem is a big problem in people's minds, but it's actually not as big as you think, and it's going away. It is going away, except for Bitcoin, which will be proof of stake forever. Now, Bitcoin- Pro proof, of, proof of work. Sorry, proof of work. Thank you, Douglas. Um, see, it was a good thing that he attended after all. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, Don, I'd actually add one other thing that people always forget about is that when you're comparing the kind of the, the transaction cost of running that network, you really should compare it against the way that, you know, the, the overall network of, of people and banks and driving around in cars and all the buildings that they live in, all the the services that are responsible for all of those intermediary, intermediary capabilities are in aggregate consuming vast amounts of energy, but it's just so distributed, we never count it. So we're not really comparing apples to apples. Yeah. And uh, Victoria, while we're on it, that's one of the two big ones. The other big one is that, well, Bitcoin and crypto, aren't they mainly used for, uh, by criminals? Um, this is also wrong. It's not true. It's uh, easily disprovable. And, um, you know, some criminals use it. Yeah, well, criminals are always the first to use exciting new technologies, you know, automobile, a flip phone, whatever. But um, the reality is that real smart law enforcement loves crypto compared to cash. Because if you and I do a transaction, I send you some money, some, a bit of Bitcoin. Um, my identity and your identity are not known um, publicly, but that leaves a trail of metadata. And smart law enforcement can analyze that metadata to spot weird things that are happening. And, um, there's a great TED talk by a woman named uh, Catherine Zahn, TEDx, where she, uh, she was a federal prosecutor. And she um, talks about how they use Bitcoin to catch the bad guys. So this is, I, the, there are 10 others of these sort of reasons why this is all a bad thing that are actually completely wrong. There's a little bit of truth, you know, 15% of 1% of Bitcoin transactions are for crime. And Bitcoin itself uses lots of energy, although the thousands of other blockchains is where the world is going to not. But you have to put all of these problems in, in um, bucket number one or bucket number two. Bucket number one is reasons why this is a bad idea and we shouldn't do it. Bucket number two is implementation challenges. And every single problem that people say to me, I, it ends up in bucket number two. We should do this. And then we should manage these implementation challenges as we go forward. Yeah, that, so uh, I see a hand up uh, here. Um, did you wanna 
Sure. Put your mic on and ask your question. <laughs> sure. Hey, Don. Uh, so my name's Amol. Thanks so much for the great talk. Um, just want to ask about you. You spoke about quite a few industries uh, in your talk. You talked about the healthcare industry, supply chain, uh, the fishing industry. None of these industries, you know, ten year, over 10 years in since this technology has been introduced, none of them have standardized uh, blockchain yet. If you were to predict, what do you think will be the first industry to really standardize it across the industry? Across the industry? Well, well that's well, easy. It's DeFi. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, non-financial. I'm curious. Other use well, cases outside of financial. Well, financial is a big one because it's the foundation of our economy. It's where all the value gets sucked. Um, it's what enables everything to work and it's all the main intermediaries. And DeFi is growing very, very rapidly right now. And that's why there's all this action on crypto. I, you know, I, I, I think that Douglas is right saying that. And I would add to that, that this is an uneven and combined thing. There are many other industries that are being affected uh, by this. Um, you know, we've been working with the oil and gas industry. I was just talking to the CIO of a, just a couple of months ago of a big oil company. And he says, we've got a dozen significant impl implementations throughout our, our business. He said, we haven't moved our core ERP to a blockchain. He can't see that happening. And given that a big company like that would have spent, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars at least investing in traditional systems, you can kind of see why it's hard to wrap your head around that. But, um, but all, you know, all, like the question is, what do you say as an industry? The diamond industry, it's based on blockchain. Um, so healthcare, that's a big one because there are a lot of different pieces to it, but the, it all comes down to the record, the patient record. And if I can own my patient record, that's a huge thing. It's going to patient records today are completely unstandardized and every hospital has got a different one. Uh, it does enable me to make a point about a whole industry transformation though, that our friends from FedEx say blockchain's a team sport. You can't do it by yourself. And Fred Smith um, is the legendary uh, executive chairman of, of uh, FedEx. And he's the guy who built this whole company. And I was interviewed uh, in front of a big audience. And he said, you know, back in the day, we would come up with a new idea, chain of custody. We'd build a system to track stuff. We'd stick a logo on it, FedEx, and we dominated an industry. He says, you can't do that today. Reinventing logistics and supply chains, he says, like, you need to partner not only with your your own suppliers and partners, but others in the industry and even your competitors. You all have to agree, for example, what's a bill of lading? So that's why this is taking uh, a long time. And you're gonna see these little breakthroughs like Everledger on diamonds, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, DeFi and, and, uh, is worth uh, hundreds of billions of dollars almost overnight, or, or, or digital assets are a new store of value and way of investing in something that are worth three trillion dollars like really quite quickly the way that happened but it's also good to have some perspective too like um i think apple's douglas is apple worth three tr trillion oh, it's one 1.3 1. trillion 1.3 okay so that's something to be humble about that uh, you know you got one company that's worth a third of what this whole thing is worth. So um, anyway, I think I think uh, cold, Don, cold right chain would be another good example. I think cold chain will go pretty quickly. Cold chain. Cold chain. The ma management of of refrigerated goods, pharmaceuticals, drugs. Oh, cold chain. Cold chain. Yeah. Don, it strikes me of how many of the examples you gave have to do with record keeping. And as an archival scientist, <laughs> I've always said that blockchain is about 
record keeping. It's just the new form of record keeping. And, and of course, record keeping has always contributed to value. So um, there's, there's a real tight connection there that, uh, that, I, that I personally love to hear about. Um, I recognize we only have a few minutes left here of your time. And so I did want to, um, I did want to ask you, I wanted to ask what I think is an important question for um, all of us, whether we're here in person or we're uh, joining virtually, we're, we're, most of us are joining from Canada, somewhere in Canada. And you did mention that uh, in Canada, we haven't really, um, we haven't really taken advantage of the opportunities presented by this new technology. And I just really wanted to tap your thoughts on how can we uh, position ourselves if we have uh, ventures that we've started here in Canada uh, and we're, we're contributing to in some way as we are at blockchain at UBC, you know, training highly skilled uh, professionals and how to, to contribute to the growth of this sector. How can we actually do better in Canada? So what advice would you have for us individually and the actions we can take uh, collectively and maybe, you know, for our politicians <laughs> uh, who maybe have to make policy decisions or our policymakers, uh, what, what are your thoughts on how we can do better? Um, two good questions. And then I see we are out of time. Um, records, uh, you bet. I wonder um, what records are around UBC? Ooh, the student record. <laughs> you know, get it on a blockchain. I wrote a whole paper about this. I did it personally. I care about it so much. It could be part of the reinvention of education. Imagine if every student has a self sovereign record that's not only high level. I got a, you know, A minus on, on my um, uh, a biology uh, 202 but it's very detailed and granular. Here's what my lab instructor said about my seventh lab and uh, the way that I presented it. And it could contain all kinds of other very granular information, but it's, it, it's uh, verifiable. You know, the pro, you know how it's moved around. And then I could start, if other universities do this, which is again why you need standards, then we could start to interoperate. Imagine if you could share your record for a certain course with another uh, institution anywhere in the world, or just say even in Canada, that would be valid and that everyone would know that that's something that could be trusted. We could start to think about the transformation of education in many ways. Because right now we still have a bit of an ivory tower model, you know, the, the uh, and you know, in fairness to education, this is the way the industrial age works. Industrial age institutions are hierarchical and, and, um, and someone at the top or forces at the top have information and, and power and they push, push that down. So we have, we receive, we are broadcast to uh, advertisements and we receive uh, newspapers and uh, we receive uh, radio programs. And we are the uh, recipients of, uh, in the church, of lectures. And we, um, you know, we have a, um, we go into the healthcare system and it's a one way. I'm a physician, I have knowledge, you're a patient, you don't get ready, here it comes. Well, in the universities, in um, over 40 years ago, I took a graduate course in statistics that was all on a computer, it was interactive, self paced. There were no lectures. Let's face it, the statistics lecture by definition is, is a bust, right? There's no one size fits all for statistics either. You know, everyone's bored or else they don't get it. And uh, I got an A and I remember thinking, because I was never good at, um, at statistics. And, and I thought, wow, um, the lectures will be gone in a decade. Now I appreciate the irony of the fact that I probably give a hundred lectures a year. Um, <laughs> of me dumping on the lecture. But let's face it, it's one way, it's one size fits all. Um, 
the students are largely passive in the learning uh, process and it's focused on the teacher. Um, so we could move towards a more modular interactive model where where institutions become more like networks and where we could patient or students could start to move around. Maybe you can get your biology 202 at Stanford. Um, so the, the notion of the student record is a really big one we're excited about. What could Canada do off the top of my head? I don't know. Douglas and Andrew might have some thoughts too, but number one, we need a better regulatory environment. The Department of Finance needs to wake up um, and start to get on this. Um, number two, um, the uh, the minister or the Department of uh, uh, Science and Economic Development needs to figure out that blockchain is a real thing that ought to be supported like AI and quantum and other technologies in Canada. Uh, we have a new CIO in the Canadian government is really open to the use of blockchain to transform government operations. That's a really big one because governments can be model users. It's one of the most important things um, that they can uh, be doing. We need and, our and, and, and Don, she's, she's a huge advocate for digital identity and yeah. the potential of using it as a primitive for all kinds yeah. of systems. Absolutely. Um, we've got... Uh, universities that could be waking up and starting to look at at uh, at student records governments at all levels can be embracing this technology i know we're working with the city of toronto just something like licensing a new restaurant that right now you have to fill out 67 forms to try and set up a restaurant this and and all these different parties and players and so on just make it a shared network state where you could speed the whole thing up, reduce the cost, and be full transparency, and 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 uh, and so on. I think our business schools should wake up. You know, and again, I could go on and on about this, but I'll just I'll end with one thing because you're a business school. Solder is a great business school. Um, we are moving to new models of the firm that are more networked and more decentralized. And ultimately, many institutions will be DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations. Read these books and you'll read about that. Um, and where governance and management is a completely different thing because there's nobody at the top. There's no controlling party. There's no traditional board in a lot of these. So we've been working with the Drucker Forum. You know, Peter Drucker is the founder of management science. I read every one of his books when I was younger and they totally influenced. I met the guy numerous times and because uh, we were on the same speaker circuit. And um, that assumed a traditional model of the organization it was hierarchical, it was, um, it was a command and control, it was vertically integrated and all these departments and resources. And, and Drucker was a great critic of this. You know, he talked about middle management as the faint boosters of uh, what passes for in, uh, communications in the pre-information age. But all of that is going to change as we move towards these very different models. Why doesn't the Sauter Business School get Victoria and, and others there to go and figure out what a whole new program is for essentially management 2.0, a whole new model of how you manage and govern an institution and an organization. So um, I'll just leave you with that uh, thought of something to be done. I'm happy to collaborate. Andrew's right there, I can help you and Douglas, we're, we're ready to go. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your great vision with us. Uh, in spite of the fact that you are still recovering. Um, and uh, it's just such a pleasure to, to have you join us. And we really look forward to, you know, sometime when you are able to actually travel to Vancouver, we would love to host you for an in-person event at that time, because I can see from the chat and from the people in the room that there are so many more questions, so many more things that people would love to ask you and tap your wisdom on. 
Um, I will just say to everyone that has participated today, both online and in person, thank you so much for being part of the blockchain at UBC community. We, uh, we have the potential, as Don said, to collaborate, to build and transform, uh, create great transformation in uh, industry and society. And we're all about that at blockchain at UBC. I'd like to put in a plug as well for us to carry on the conversation at the Blockchain Technology Symposium, which will be hosted this year by the University of Calgary. It's a pan-Canadian forum where we bring academics, we bring policymakers, and we bring industry leaders together to talk about where are we now with blockchain technology. So it's a great opportunity to, to carry on the conversation after, after the, the great foundation that, that Don has introduced for us today. So uh, do Google that and, and links are up. So Blockchain Technology Symposium 2022 and, uh, and check out the program and join. Uh, it's, uh, it would be great to, to have all of you who have joined today and in person participate in that event as well uh, because we, we need the murmuring to take place. <laughs> we need to work together to build that momentum and that critical mass. So thank you everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure, Don. Thank you so much again. It's very generous of you to take the time to speak to us, even though you're not feeling well. Um, Doug, great to see you again. Andrew, nice to see you online. I look forward to meeting you in person as well. And we'll just end it there for today for our session. And uh, please do join us for upcoming blockchain at UBC uh, talks as well. So thanks, everybody. And we'll connect again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.